Welcome in to Outkick the Show. I am your fearless leader, Clay Travis. I hope wherever you may be across this great country or this great land, you are having a fantastic Wednesday. Uh, we got a bunch of stories to get to. I got a television show to knock out here in about 45 minutes, so let's dive right into it and start with uh, Jake Fromm is going pro. This is a big hit to Georgia. I understand Georgia may be able to get a transfer uh, player in. Jacob Eason was at Georgia as a five-star. We all know uh, that you had a situation where he decided to transfer to Washington and then you get Justin Fields deciding to transfer to Ohio State. So you effectively have three five-star quarterbacks. Only Justin Fields will be left. Georgia going to have to go back to the drawing board. They're also losing a lot of offensive linemen. I think this means that you have to make the Florida Gators the favorite to win the SEC East now with Jake Fromm going the best returning quarterback uh, I believe in the entirety of the SEC is going to be what Florida's got coming back. Uh, you know, Felipe Franks is deciding to transfer, but I continue to believe that the situation that Florida has is the best possible situation. Five-star left tackle Cade Mays, who was a star of Georgia's recruiting class, is going to transfer to Tennessee. The Georgia offensive line losing a lot of people ever since Sam Pittman departed. I believe that Florida is now your favorite in the SEC East. Dan Mullen's team uh, is going to be behind Kyle Trask, the favorite to go out and be able to win the SEC East. I also think Tennessee is trending up in a substantial way. Uh, Tennessee may be able to run with Georgia. Georgia people want to talk about their recruiting classes, but you are losing a lot of recruits. It is a mess right now in Athens with all the transfers, with everybody bailing. Uh, the offense was not good this past year. I don't know why they would be expected to be good uh, in the coming year with the current uh, cluster of talent there. So I like Georgia to regress. I think they may have hit their peak and started to regress a little bit. Not to say they not might not be able to climb back up. Uh, but I believe Georgia is on the decline now. They had their window to win a championship. They weren't able to do it. I think Florida and Tennessee are on the upswing. Not saying Georgia can't have a good year. Don't misunderstand me. Just saying losing Jake Fromm I think is going to be substantial. I think that uh, there's a good chance Fromm will go at the end of the first round. And I said before the season started, I thought Fromm was going to have a step like we saw from uh, Joe Burrow. And I still believe that it was the offense that really handcuffed him in Athens. They were awful on the offensive side of the ball. The wide receiving talent was weak. They didn't use DeAndre Swift very well. The absence of Jim Chaney, I believe, was substantial in terms of their overall talent on the offensive side of the ball when it comes to production. Uh, George Pickens looks great in the Sugar Bowl, but I think there are ominous signs right now in Georgia in terms of them being able to compete at a higher level. Uh, somebody said, what makes Tennessee better than eight wins next year? The third year in Jeremy Pruitt's system. Third year in Jeremy Pruitt's system and the fact that they are going to have now almost a full complement of talent. They had a lot of young people playing a lot of uh, snaps at Tennessee this year. A lot of true freshmen. Is it, look, I mean, again, think about what has happened in the first 16 games Jeremy Pruitt coached at Tennessee. Tennessee was the underdog in 15 of them. That's how bad the talent was left behind by Butch Jones. In the first 16 games that Jeremy Pruitt and his staff coached at Tennessee, they were the underdog in 15 of them. And they won seven of those games, okay? I think they're going to be competitive uh, at the upper echelon uh, next year. We'll see exactly how it goes. Uh, but uh, I think Georgia is going to take a big step back. I expect for Jake Fromm to end up uh, in, in some way, uh, in the late first round as the uh, draft pick, okay? Uh, so that is the news from Jake Fromm and from the SEC. I want to talk for a minute about Donald Trump's speech in Iran. Uh, on, on Iran, not on, not in Iran. That would be a real upset if he had gone to uh, Tehran to uh, to make his statement. You have to stop. And I, I'm not saying you specifically. I'm saying like the the universe in general has to stop tweeting, uh, treating Twitter as real life because Twitter is a catastrophe factory. Everything is about to be the worst thing that has ever happened. If you look at what happened. Uh, with everything that Trump has done, you just keep tallying everything up which is, oh my God, this is a disaster. Calling Ukraine is a disaster. Russia is a disaster. Collusion is a disaster. 
firing the FBI investigator. The head of the FBI is a disaster. Oh my God, uh, we've got uh, Jeff Sessions leaving. It's going to be a total disaster. One after the other, people want to buy in. The immigration policy is a disaster. The walls is a disaster. Everything is catastrophized on social media. And people buy into this idea that every single thing that happens is the new worst thing that's ever occurred. And they go hyperbolic way outside of reasonable situations. And the same thing happened with Iran again. We acted to send a message to Iran that we were not going to countenance their behavior in the Middle East. We had been incredibly deferential and allowed them to provoke us time after time after time. And we are like the big brother that finally decided to put the little brother in a headlock and let him know that we were tired of being messed with. Right? I've got, I've got kids. Sometimes the little brother pokes and the little brother pokes and the little brother pokes and then finally the big brother just puts him in a headlock and says, Hey, I am tired of this. Okay? Iran is, in college football terms, the University of Michigan. They are perpetual uh, contenders for the crown in their own mind who most people know that when push comes to shove they're going to fold, they're going to wilt, they are not ready for prime time. All right? Iran, I, I, like, I, I talked to my kids about this. They said, Dad, what should we think, my oldest did, my 11-year-old, said, what should we think about this Iran situation? I'm like, Iran is like uh, your little brother's 8-year-old basketball team and the United States is like the dream team that you've seen the YouTube videos of in 1992. It's like those two sides playing a game. This isn't real. The idea of World War III or any other chaos that was going to fall out of this is utterly insane. The United States could wipe Iran off the planet in like 20 minutes if we wanted to. And they know it. Which is why when we killed Soleimani they took it and they came back with this weak impotent response that had absolutely no impact that they were able to sell through their propaganda in their media in their country as being a big stand that they took against the great Satan the United States of America. The reality is the United States is not threatened by Iran. We have the ability at any point in time to end Iran and they know it. And they know it and that's what frustrates them so much. It's like an 8-year-old basketball team playing against the dream team. That's what it is in sports context. So I thought Trump's statement was good. I thought it was well written. I thought it was well done. I thought he delivered it well. You could immediately say what I always say is don't pay attention to social media. All right, Look at what the stock market is doing. Markets tell you stories not idiots on social media of any stripe trying to tell you what matters. And as Donald Trump spoke the stock market soared to a new I believe S&P 500 high and a new NASDAQ high all time. All you have to do is go and look at the, uh, at the markets as the president speaks and you will see what the world thinks of what the president is doing and saying. And the reality is this. While so many people want to live in a perpetual, perpetual universe where everything is always a disaster and where World War III is right around the corner the reality is this. The 2010s were the greatest decade in human achievement of all time. The things that we accomplished in the 2010s. Things are getting better every single day. There is a desire on social media because some people hate Donald Trump so much for everything to be getting worse every day. The reality is every year of Donald Trump's administration so far things have gotten better in America. And that drives liberals crazy because they've been selling the same thing over and over again which is disaster is right around the corner. Over and over again just look at all the lists of things that were going to be disasters. This was going to be it for Trump. Going all the way back to his campaign from the time when he said that Megyn Kelly had blood coming out of her or whatever. People were like, oh, this is disqualifying. It's never going to be able to be president now. Oh, look at the video that came out. The reality is Trump is a disruptor. And the United States organizations are much more flexible and much less rigid than the media wants to believe. The media wants for there to be a major reckoning because otherwise they have no power. 
They have no power because they've tried to bring down Donald Trump from the minute he got into office and they haven't been able to do it. And so they are so outraged by him. They are driven so insane that again, people want to compare this time to another time in history. I'm telling you guys, I lived through it. This is the late 90s, except now the president is a Republican instead of a Democrat. Republicans were driven insane by Bill Clinton. They believed that everything he did was going to be awful. Uh, and they went after him. And he got impeached. And it was all for uh, really kind of smoke and mirrors. The same thing has happened with Donald Trump. We've replaced a vast right-wing conspiracy with a vast left-wing conspiracy. I think Trump's going to get reelected. He right now is minus 120, which are the, uh, the biggest favorite he's ever been in his political career to be elected president. If you want to go bet right now, Donald Trump isn't just, the, isn't just the favorite to be president, which would make sense because the Democrats haven't picked a nominee yet. He's favored. And so he's, I think, made the right decision with Iran. He has sent an unbelievable message to them that no one is safe if they are going to step to the United States and threaten us. From the Ayatollah on down, they know that they are on notice. And you can make an argument that they may have even intentionally tried to avoid hitting and injuring anybody at the U.S. military base because they were so afraid of the way that Trump would respond. They gave an impotent, broken response that they will sell to their, uh, to their unfortunately behind a totalitarian wall group of people in Iran. The rest of the world will know that they are weaklings and that they have no ability to do anything on a substantial scale. And so, this is a big win for Trump as much as people might hate that Trump took this action. It was dramatic, it was se severe, and it was significant. And I see it as a huge win for the United States and our geopolitical standing in the Middle East. In particular, I see it as a big win for Iran knowing that we won't mess around again. Uh, all right, Tom Brady puts out a... I talk about range. We cover a lot of range on this show. Tom Brady uh, puts out a statement saying, quote, he has more to prove. Uh, right now, you can bet on the odds markets as to where Brady will be playing. We're going to discuss this on Lock It In in a little bit. I kind of think that it's going to come down to a debate inside of New England with Belichick and Kraft over how many years they want to guarantee to Brady. I don't see Brady wanting to do a year at a time. I think he's going to want a two-year commitment. Will the Patriots give him a two-year commitment? If not, then I think there are a lot of teams out there that will kick the tires on whether or not Tom Brady makes sense going forward. Whether it's the Chargers, uh, whether it's maybe the Panthers, uh, whether it is uh, the Dallas Cowboys, Chicago Bears, there are a lot of Miami Dolphins. There are a lot of teams out there, I think, that are in desperate need of a quarterback that believe they're only one quarterback away, uh, the right quarterback away, from being able to contend for a Super Bowl. I would have put the Titans in that mix, maybe the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. I would put a lot of teams in that mix. Same teams that Phillip Rivers will be looking at, by the way. Same teams that maybe Cam Newton will be looking at. Teddy Bridgewater, Marcus Mariota, Jameis Winston. It's going to be a really exciting offseason, not just as it pertains to Jake Fromm, to Tua Tagovailoa, to Joe Burrow, uh, to Jacob Eason, to all of the uh, first-round potential quarterbacks, but also for what's going to happen with all of the free agents. I think for the best aspect of his legacy, Brady should finish his career with the Patriots. I think that's a better legacy for him than going elsewhere. But I think Tom Brady wants to be wanted. He's a lot like a, uh, a Hollywood star who suddenly gets divorced, he needs to hear that he's still got it, that people still want him. And so I think the best possible solution for Brady after a lot of flirtation will be to end up back with the New England Patriots. The question is, does Belichick really want him or would Belichick like to turn the page and start to prepare for a, uh, for a tenure after Brady? Because I think both these guys would like to in their ideal world prove they don't need the other person to win a Super Bowl. I think Brady would like to win a Super Bowl without Belichick to prove that he was the most important part of the Patriot dynasty. These guys have egos. I think Belichick would like to win a Super Bowl without Brady to prove that he is the most important part of the Patriot dynasty. Both of these guys want to be given all of the credit. The reality is neither could have accomplished what they did without the other. 20 years ago, 20 years ago at this date and close to this time, I was, instead of being an old man at 40, was a young, spry, 20-year-old college kid and I was in the stands 
at Adelphia Coliseum at the time it was called for the Music City Miracle which is one of the most iconic plays in the history of football, college or pro. I was sitting in the north end zone. I had a perfect view of the play developing. I was standing right there beside my dad. We were watching the Bills against the Titans. I saw the kick come down. I was convinced it was a defeat. I saw the throwback. Saw Kevin Dyson come running down and the stadium went insane. It was a bitterly cold day in Nashville. I know there's a lot of people who claim to have been there. Let me tell you, there were a lot of people leaving. I was still there. I was standing up in the seats and I was terrified. It felt like that review right after the play lasted forever before they came out and announced that it was a lateral and that the touchdown stood And it was as joyous of an occasion as I have ever been a part of in a football stadium. I can't believe it has been 20 years now. Uh, 20 years since that game was played. The Titans went on to beat the Indianapolis Colts and the Jacksonville Jaguars to advance to the Super Bowl and end up losing by a yard. We didn't know how good we had it as young Titan fans then. That was, by the way, just a couple of years after the University of Tennessee had won a national championship as well. So the state of Tennessee was literally the focal point of, uh, of the universe. I think the toughest loss during that Titan dynasty year was not the Super Bowl. It was the next year against uh, the Baltimore Ravens in the divisional round of the playoffs when the Titans held them to like 120 yards of total offense and the Ravens and Ray Lewis, uh, they managed to block a field goal and return it for a touchdown They managed to uh, intercept the pass and return it for a touchdown. They had no business winning that football game. The Titans were the best team in the NFL that year. And I feel like that was the Super Bowl and they lost it. So, a big part of me doesn't just want to beat the Ravens this weekend for this season, which is obviously always uh, the, the, the goal. But the Ravens have twice come to Nashville and beaten the Titans as the number one overall seed in the AFC. I was at both of those games. And in both of those losses, the Titans were the better team that happened to choke away the game. Ravens are the better team than the Titans this year. There's no doubt. I would like for the Titans to get some revenge. They went on the road and beat the Ravens a couple of years after that. But I would like for them to get some revenge here and be able to uh, to beat the Ravens to get revenge for the year when we should have been one of those two years at least, really both of them, we should have been able to host the AFC Championship game in Nashville. Uh, So that was 20 years ago today. Uh, If you haven't heard that call, if you haven't seen that video, if you're a young guy or girl out there watching this right now or listening to it, uh, go back and check it out. Uh, Your uh, esteemed host here was still a young man. Couldn't even drink a beer legally uh, when that happened 20 years ago. Finally, uh, finally, I got to go do television here in a minute uh, with Lock It In. But how about Harry and Meghan are entering the transfer portal? They have decided that they don't want to be members of the royal family anymore. This is a weird story. I don't know what's going on with Meghan, but this feels like a relationship where if you have uh, a friend who gets married to the wrong person and then suddenly they start becoming an entirely different person, I don't know anything about Prince Harry, right? I don't know anything about uh, what he's actually like. But this feels like a broken relationship. If you get married to somebody and you become a totally different person than you were before you got married to them, that's not a good sign to me. Because it represents somebody trying to take control of you and make you not be the person that you were before. It can be a guy or a girl and everybody out there listening to me right now knows what I'm talking about. You end up in a relationship. It's not a good relationship and you're constantly trying to make the other person happy and that's what I feel like is going on right now with Prince Harry and this Meghan uh, Markle. After many months of reflection and internal discussions we have chosen to make a transition this year in starting to carve out a progressive new role within this institution. We intend to step back as senior members of the royal family and work to become financially independent while continuing to fully support Her Majesty the Queen. It is with your encouragement, particularly over the last few years, that we feel prepared to make this adjustment. This is weird. It's a weird behavior. Uh, Prince Harry and Meghan Markle now in the transfer portal. Um, I think it's a really strange setup and I don't know exactly what's going on here. 
Uh, but this is weird. It's a major story over the pond uh, in England. Uh, you guys know I've made, I don't know, four or five trips to England. I absolutely love it over there. And so I'm fascinated by the royal family and how everything shakes out down there. But this is a weird story. I don't think we're getting the full scope of it. I can't be that hard to be a member of the royal family. I'm sorry. I understand it might not be ideal. might not always be fun. But Prince Harry seemed to be doing fine on his own. And then he gets married and all the world comes undone. I don't get it. All right. I love all of you. My name is Clay Travis. This has been Outkick the Show. We do it every single day right about these times. Uh, appreciate all of you. DBAP unless you need to. SBAP will be back tomorrow. Uh, and I, yeah, that's a good point. The kicker is they announced that without telling anyone in the royal family. Buck Buckingham Palace put out a statement. They don't really understand what exactly is going on there either. Good point on that as well. Okay, DBAP, unless you need to SBAP, I am Clay Travis. This has been Outkick the Show. Watch me now uh, on, uh, lock it in, 4.30 Eastern, 3.30 Central, 2.30 Mountain, 1.30 Pacific, FS1, Monday through Friday. We're getting you ready for the divisional round NFL playoff games as well as the college football title game, which will be on Monday. I'm headed down to New Orleans, by the way, on Sunday. We'll be down there for that game on Monday. See y'all. Love you. Love you. Thank you, Facebook.